Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and the title of today's episode is Never Again Must Be Now in Ukraine, Genocide and War Crimes Grinding Away at Our Collective Soul. War crimes and genocide are continuing in the Ukraine. They're being committed by Russian policies and brutal actions. The horrible and heinous killings of civilians, as well as the abductions of journalists, activists, and city mayors demand our world to make sure never again has meaning. The innocent people's lives require a strong response rooted in international human rights and humanitarian law. And the first wave of the war indicates Ukraine is a symbol of freedom. The daily actions by Ukraine illustrates the commitment to democracy and liberty with the desire to cherish human rights in daily lives. The world response requires innovative initiatives and strong international institutions. So today we're joined by Tatiana, who is the head of the Human Rights Center, Zmina. Tatiana, thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, good, good morning, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to have you here because we know that it's 50 days of violence and death since the war began. There's been 16 emergency UN Security Council meetings and unfortunately close to two thirds of all children in Ukraine have been forced to flee their homes because of the ongoing war in the country and more than 4.6 million people from Ukraine and displaced estimates 7.1 million internally. How are you holding up? Um, right, it's the most tragic days uh, in the modern history of our country, which became independent after the collapse of the USSR. And uh, my organization uh, uh, is documenting uh, war crimes and crimes against, against humanity across Ukraine. Uh, we've been working uh, on the documentation of human rights abuses in the occupied Crimea since 2014, and also uh, fixed uh, violations during the war in Donbass. But uh, what we saw before, it uh, cannot be compared to what we have now. Unfortunately, it's very grim, uh, tragic date for the whole history of, of our country. And even those experienced human rights defenders, uh, even for them, it's very difficult to work with. No, we thank you so much for your bravery to do this work in the face of such horrors. And we know there's evidence of civilian murders, indiscriminate shelling, and the Polish president, Duda, even stated, quote, it's not a war, this is terrorism. We also know this week, President Joe Biden claimed it was genocide, saying, quote, it's becoming clear and clear that Putin is just trying to wipe out even the idea of being Ukrainian. And now we think and we appreciate the Ukrainian president tweeting, calling things by their names is essential to stand up to evil. So it's really important to see all the work that you're doing to document what's happening. Yes, uh, it is very important because uh, Russia is spreading disinformation and false uh, fake news across uh, the world that uh, uh, this old, uh, atro all atrocities and nightmare happening in Ukraine. It's uh, just uh, not true that uh, we do it for ourselves, uh, that this is a fake story. That's why it's very important. And we have a huge number of international media working in Ukraine and covering these stories. Unfortunately, some journalists uh, were already uh, killed uh, during the, the shellings. Uh, uh, the foreign journalists, as well as, as Ukrainian journalists, cameramen. Uh, this is very dangerous, but uh, we are very grateful for them that they tell the world uh, true story, what is happening in Ukraine. And unfortunately, uh, when, for example, when Russian uh, army uh, left the north, northern part of Kyiv region, Chernihiv region, Sumy region, uh, even more atrocities were discovered uh, when people were killed uh, with sight and hands, uh, when uh, uh, hundreds of civilians were buried in mass graves, when uh, Russian uh, troops were shooting with their tanks, people who were trying, uh, civilians who were trying to evacuate from these cities uh, with their kids, with wives. Uh, and uh, for example, the house uh, of uh, my family is in Irpin, it's a city near Kiev, it's Irpin, Bucha, and Hostomai. And our house was uh, destroyed, damaged because the bomb uh, uh, hit the house uh, and the roof uh, is uh, now we have a huge hole in the roof and the bomb uh, uh, was uh, set, uh, like uh, hit directly to the uh, to our bedroom so this is 
something that's happening to all of us. And uh, but uh, I would say, and and a, a lot of people were forced to leave, uh, and we were lucky to evacuate uh, the parents of my husband. Uh, so they are now in safe place. But if would, they would stay for a couple of days there, uh, I even cannot imagine what would happen to them because that part of the city was occupied for some for several weeks by by Russian troops. It, it's absolutely heartbreaking to hear that your home was shelled and that there's a hole in the roof. But it's so good to hear, though, that your family was safe. But this is really just the beginning of, of the human rights violations that are, are happening. Amnesty International, of course, has also affirmed what you shared of extrajudicially executed citizens. Also, it's important that they've been finding the bodies around 360 civilians in Buka, near where you were describing, but also the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, has also done a report and they were able to get agreement from 45 of the 57 participating states to look into the war crimes and have just released their most recent report that confirms much of what you've been saying. That's true. Actually, uh, this report was published uh, yesterday and it was done by the expert of the so-called Moscow mechanism, which was uh, launched by uh, the OSCE several decades ago. And this was done by the group of three independent experts, the professors of, in, of the international uh, law. And actually, we met these experts. Uh, I visited uh, uh, se several weeks ago. Uh, I visited Wien together with my other colleagues, human rights defenders from Ukraine and uh, we have a coalition which is called Ukraine 5 a.m. coalition. 5 a.m. is the time when all we woke up from the sounds of explosion uh, in different cities uh, of Ukraine on 24th of February. And uh, uh, actually on the second day of the war, we already started to collect the data about war crimes, working also from, from bomb shelters because uh, uh, we often, uh, very often have uh, air strike uh, uh, alarm. So we have to go to, to the shelters, to the uh, metro station. So uh, I slept uh, some nights on the platform of metro station or underground parking so it's really risky to uh, work and uh, and stay here but it is important that uh, uh, all my NGO is working here on the ground from different cities uh, of Ukraine and we document and collect this data together with 26 other organizations and uh, this data uh, was sent also to the experts of the OSC, and in their report they referred to our coalition that they used our materials. I think this is this uh, like the collection of data on the ground is very important also for different international organizations and for their assessment of the situation. As always, the NGOs are really the oxygen of the human rights movement, and the work that you're doing is really crucial. It is the most important. So we thank you and encourage you to continue, of course, as you're doing. And you can see results already. And as you described, the new NGO, the movement coming together of 5 a.m., it's powerful to see how the, the times you're living in are framing the, the new networks that you're creating. And I've been on the, on the subways there in Kiev and, and can see exactly where they are. It's the quickest metro escalators I've ever seen in my life. It's just, but it, I'm so glad that you're being safe. And we can always see already the results of your important human rights documentation because the OSCE mission found clear patterns of international humanitarian law violations by the Russian forces. And they cited specifically the failures to take necessary precautions and proportionality or spare sites like schools and hospitals. They also did agree with the March 16 attack on the Mariupol Drama Theater. And they said that was definitely a war crime where 300 people were killed. That's true, uh, but uh, uh, we also would like to draw attention to uh, another problem because this report was done uh, not uh, by the work of the experts on the ground. And uh, unfortunately, uh, OSC uh, special monitoring mission left Ukraine uh, at the beginning of the war. They have uh, their staff uh, around 1,000 of uh, their staff. Uh, they were working on Don in Donbass all these years, and uh, they 
fix uh, uh, the shellings and casualties during that uh, war in Donbass. But when uh, that large scale uh, uh, conflict erupted, almost all of them uh, left Ukraine and uh, alongside with the international staff of many other foreign missions. Now the situation is better because uh, some of them, uh, some uh, organizations bring more staff uh, to Ukraine, but uh, it's, uh, it is very important for us that we are not alone, uh, alone here working and collecting all the data and trying to provide also uh, humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable groups. Uh, for example, the, my colleague from my NGO, uh, Lyudmila Yankina, she works in Kiev as a medical volunteer and uh, she supplies the food and medicine for elderly people, for seri seriously ill people with cancer, with other uh, uh, problems, uh, because they need to survive throughout all this war. And it is very important that all society is united and people uh, donate a lot of money and they uh, I, I remember that the last time from Euromaidan uh, eight years ago, when all people work together as uh, one big mechanism and everyone has its own role, uh, which is very important for the full system to function. No, maybe you could share with us because you really are the catalyst and the spark to create that flame of justice by the work that you're doing there on the ground. Can you share how you're able to communicate and coordinate after setting up the network of the Ukraine 5 a.m. and the way that you've been able to operate so far? Uh, yes, actually, all communication and coordination is done through protected channels, uh, through messengers. Uh, it's very important that the uh, internet and bank system works well in Ukraine. We are even able to send money for bank cards cards for those people, activists, journalists who are now on the newly occupied territories by Russia, like Kherson uh, and other, uh, other cities, other regions. So uh, we communicate mainly via this electronic means uh, and everyone is in a different place. And this is very important that in case if when we have the problems uh, with internet coverage, uh, we receive the support from uh, Elon Musk and Starlink were already provided uh, not only for Ukrainian army, but also, uh, also we have a, as human rights defenders, we also have some Starlink that we can use in the territories where there is a problem with connection. No, and it, it's really important because in the end, this is definitely a war of Russia's choice and the West and many diplomats around the world from the international organizations, the United Nations, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, but many governments tried many bilateral actions and many things were done to prevent this conflict. But as we look at it, it's really important that, unfortunately, Russia is hell bent on continuing this and inflicting, it seems, as much pain as possible. And one of the sad parts is the new appointment of General Dvornikov, because if you look at his history of what he's done in the past, it's been brutal assaults on civilian population centers in Syria and other locations. So the work that you've done so far in this first 50 days is even more important going forward. That's true, and uh, the reason why this uh, uh, war is happening now in the heart, uh, heart of Europe is the impunity of the Russian Federation for all uh, war crimes they committed in previous conflicts. I'm not even speaking about Crimea and Donbass, uh, the territories of Ukraine which were already occupied by Russia eight years ago, but this is also about Georgia, about uh, Russian war crimes in Syria, uh, about Russian war crimes in Chechnya. And uh, there were no accountability for what they did throughout uh, the uh, last decades. And uh, I think that uh, the Western world was underestimating the evil which was growing inside Russian Federation. Uh, after the occupation of Crimea, we were screaming and asking to impose very strict sanctions against Russian Federation to stop buying Russian oil and gas. But uh, uh, on the contrary, the Nord Stream 2 was built up and uh, many countries uh, were supplying oil 
also military equipment to Russia. So the Russian regime was growing up all these eight years and finally it attacked. And this is very important. The message I want to, to, to deliver that if Ukraine uh, Ukraine will not stand against it. If Ukraine will not win, the regime will uh, move forward. It can be a big global war. Uh, it is very important to stop it now and to punish this evil because uh, this impunity would provoke them for new and new uh, and new conflicts. I agree. I was there in 2015 and 2016, and you could see the monuments made for the people who had already been killed in Crimea as well as in Donbass in that region. And it's one of those aspects of why we need a strong international human rights and humanitarian law system, because unfortunately, authoritarian regimes and brutal dictators, if not confronted, unfortunately, keep moving and going forward. And there are many lessons in history. So we have to have a strong system that's rooted in human rights to protect people, but also to prevent, to make sure that a person would actually think of the consequences and that had not been done in 2014 with the actions. And that's why now I agree with you that the actions by Ukraine today is really standing on freedom's frontier, but it would have continued rolling into other parts of Europe. And that's why there's more solidarity and support for the people of Ukraine. But there's no reason you should have to sacrifice and alone and why we all need to work together to make sure that that phrase of never again, which was uttered after the horrors of the Holocaust, is not just a slogan, but actually a structure, a system that prevents any more homes like yours being bombed and, and innocent deaths taking place. Yes, that's true. Unfortunately, 80 years after the Second World War, we have the uh, growing uh, science of fascism in the neighboring country. And this is a, an irony because uh, they declared their uh, uh, war as a military op operation in Ukraine in order to denazify Ukraine. But uh, uh, the real problem is inside Russian Federation where majority of the population supports it, Putin, uh, Putin's policy support in bloody war and the propaganda uh, was so uh, hard and so powerful that even having relatives in Russia many of Ukrainians cannot convince them and cannot deliver them what is happening there because they would rather believe uh, their crazy uh, television than uh, their real uh, close relatives living in Ukraine and I think for them in a way uh, it is also that they do not want to, to admit this information because to accept it means for them to recognize that they did really terrible things to us uh, and that they allowed uh, this evil inside them to dominate uh, by supporting this aggressive Putin's policy. That's why it is very important, that you, as you say, to ensure uh, the justice and accountability. And uh, we have, uh, of course, the justice and uh, investigation would be mainly domestic work for Ukrainian law enforcement system, because uh, we have now uh, uh, Ukrainian prosecutor's office registered over 6,000 6, criminal proceedings. And this is only a part. Uh, there would be much more when the new territories would be opened, like Mariupol, when the investigators have access to Mariupol, there would be much more criminal proceedings. And uh, uh, there is no one international court that could deal with so many uh, you know, episodes and criminal proceedings. Uh, so it would be mainly domestic work for Ukrainian law enforcement, but it is very important that the, the international courts like like ICC in the, in the Hague uh, also will assess and follow the chain of commands because this is not just some, you know, uh, 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 some attacks by mistake that are committed by Russian soldiers in some re regions. It is their deliberate policy to uh, uh, cause as much uh, harm to the civilian population as possible. And they conduct this war 
with violations of all the, of uh, all the rules of the war. They uh, fight the Russian army fights not only against Ukrainian army, but they fight against civilian population, and they commit all sorts of war crimes, including extrajudicial killing, destroyings of uh, uh, residential areas, kindergartens, schools. They attack ambulances and hospitals. They uh, there is a big uh, de deportation of the population from those uh, newly occupied territories uh, to Russia, and we think it's uh, our like estimation. Uh, estimation is that this is at least two hundred thousand of Ukrainians that were deported to the territory of Russia from those Ukrainian territories taken by them. Uh, there are a lot of uh, landmines, and on, on those released territories, uh, people uh, just are killed by these um, uh, mines when, for example, they uh, uh, drive with a car and, uh, and there are explosions. So this is a, a, a huge problem uh, which we will have to deal with. And also uh, we uh, call for establishment of the special tribunal on the crime of aggression, because because unlike uh, the crime of uh, genocide of, uh, or uh, crime, crimes against humanity, war crimes, which are under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, uh, the, the crime of aggression, which was the, the, like the crime from which uh, other crimes were possible, will not, uh, due to jurisdictional limitation, go under their, uh, the, their jurisdiction. That's why we also call for the establishment of the special tribunal uh, on the crime of aggression uh, of Putinist regime against Ukraine. And we would uh, uh, like to see this tribunal one day in the rebuilt drama theater in Mariupol. Thank you so much. No, and it really does connect the points where if you don't have human rights at home, then of course the human rights of the global scene also crumbles. And that's the example where Putin has been a brutal dictator, killing and poisoning any political rivals, uh, passing new laws that if you say war or invasion, you would be up to 20 years in prison for any journalist. So it's that deterioration of human rights in the country that then allows him to operate with impunity. But it's amazing to see many Russians still standing up and organizing and others leaving and fleeing, saying that they can no longer stand it. And we have to look at what we can do to then be able to make sure that human rights are respected inside countries, but also in the global arena. And that's why the Human Rights Council's new uh, commission of inquiry will release its first report in September that will also fulfill and build on some of the important work you're doing. You've also looked at some of the most gruesome cases though, with mayors being abducted. And could you share a bit about what has happened to leaders who have been trying to do their, their job to protect their, their people in certain cities of Ukraine and the fate that they have faced, unfortunately, these war crimes? Yes, that's a typical practice of Russian Federation. When they occupied uh, a territory, uh, they uh, start immediately abduction of active local citizens. And we saw it from Crimea in uh, March 2014. Uh, Russians and local paramilitary group acting together with Russian army called Crimea, Crimean Self-Defense uh, kidnapped uh, dozens of local journalists, uh, activists, uh, mainly from Crimean Tatar origin the indigenous people of Crimea, and many of them are still missing. Uh, we think that eight years uh, uh, these people are not alive anymore. And this practice then was continued in Donbass, in the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. Uh, so now uh, when Russian uh, troops uh, uh, got control over some uh, parts of Ukraine, like Donetsk region, uh, Kherson region, Zaporizhia region, uh, they started to kidnap active uh, local people, uh, village heads, uh, city mayors, uh, volunteers, activists, journalists. Uh, as for now, uh, our NGO uh, documented over 130 cases of enforced disappearances. And uh, some people were already released, but majority still are uh, kept uh, in detention and uh, many of them are tortured uh, and uh, kept incommunicado. Uh, there is no connection with them. And uh, six people were already found uh, uh, murdered. Uh, and one of them, for example, uh, the, the village head of the uh, uh, village Motijan near Kiev, uh, her body 
she was kidnapped and then uh, when uh, Russians uh, left this territory, her body was found uh, in a grave together with uh, her uh, husband and her son. So why, they, why Russians do this cruel practice? Uh, there are two reasons. First of all, they want to push uh, local self-government representatives uh, to cooperate with them, to collaborate with them. But people are not greeting them, are not welcoming them. So they uh, uh, kidnap these active members of local communities to terrify others, to stop the resilience, because resilience is very big. The nation is very united. And in many of those occupied cities, there are peaceful demonstrations with Ukrainian flags against this uh, aggression uh, under the gun of, Rush, uh, of Russian uh, troops. So in order to break this resilience, they kidnap and torture the most active members uh, of the local community. But uh, we have already, we have a part of Ukraine which was taken by them, already released, and we do hope that the rest of Ukraine will be released. Our army uh, is fighting very strong, uh, uh, strongly against uh, this invasion, and we hope that this uh, uh, war will be over and uh, all, all the society supports army. And what we need from, from the uh, rest of the world, from the countries like the United States, by, by President Biden, I just read before, our interview, he said that uh, he wants to come to Ukraine. So we expect him here in Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, 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 because we already had the visits of the presidents of uh, Baltic states, of Poland, uh, and also uh, Boris Johnson, British prime minister. So I was in Poland, Poland when, uh, when uh, President Biden visited Poland, uh, uh, but he didn't come to Ukraine. So maybe he changed his opinion and we uh, wait him here, but uh, our message is that uh, we are ready to stand and to fight against Russian aggression, but we need more support, more military equip equipment to protect our state, and we need uh, the oil and gas embargo to uh, stop functioning Russian war machine because they use this money for uh, attack, uh, for military attack uh, to Ukraine. Thank you so much, and you really did connect all of the campaigns. It, it's been important to build the international law system with the International Criminal Court, with the international uh, focus on the new Commission of Inquiry and the Human Rights Council through the UN General Assembly, removing Russia from the Human Rights Council, but then also the important role of corporations to not allow the funds to continue to then really allow for the perpetuation of the war crimes. And then of course, the campaign on the ground by the people. I know the song that's resonating with everyone is the new Pink Floyd release, Hey, Hey, Rise Up, with the lead singer of Boombox. And so we hope that music can inspire us as we keep this movement going to stand up for justice for all people. But thank you for all the work that you do and the human rights advocacy. And we stand with you in solidarity. And we send aloha from Hawaii to you. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Thank you to all, all people uh, of Hawaii for support of Ukraine. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.